welcome to you all and thank you for joining us for the second week of UNIMED 6th edition. Today's webinar is entitled Climate Change, Food and Water and Migration Outlines in the Mediterranean, Insights from the Intercultural Trends Report uh, by the Anna Lind Foundation. Uh, this webinar is organized in collaboration with the Anna Lindt Foundation and the UNIMED subnetworks on climate and environmental change, food and water and migration, and with the participation of IOM, International Organization for Migration. The main objective is to try to understand the impact of climate changes on migration and intercultural cooperation in the Mediterranean. The webinar is an occasion to learn about some key findings of the new edition of the Intercultural Trends and Social Changes Report of the Anna Lind Foundation to get some hints for enhancing Euro-Mediterranean cooperation and understand how the culture is a powerful tool for strengthening dialogue. Climate change, uh, has become a major concern for international community. Among its consequences, the impact on migration is increasingly attracting the attention of policymakers and researchers. Knowledge in the field remains limited and fragmented, and there are still uncertainties about the actual mechanisms at stake, the number of persons affected, and the geographical zones concerned. The available information on the issue is heterogeneous because of the conceptual and methodological divides. Data pertaining to the environmental and migratory dynamics rarely come from the same sources and are hard to combine. Environmental change and disasters have always been major drivers of migration. However, Climate change predictions for the 21st century indicate that more people are expected to be on the move as several recent events and natural disasters have shown. This is particularly true for the Euromed region, which is considered a hotspot of climate change and environmental migration. It is clear that the interest in climate and environmental issues transcend borders, educational levels, and generation. It is important to take into account not only the objective characteristics in the environmental degradations, but also people's perceptions and representations of these evolutions and their potential migration consequences. The measure of the impact of environmental factors on displacement should be supplemented by an examination of the sociocultural perceptions and representations of these threats among the populations concerned. Today's webinar is an occasion to share the key findings of the new editions of the Intercultural Trends and Social Changes Report of the Anna Lind Foundation to get some hints for enhancing Euro-Mediterranean cooperation and reveal the power of culture for strengthening dialogue. Uh, today's webinar is, of course, uh, includes experts in the field and really high caliber researchers. And the agenda, as announced, will start with uh, uh, a welcome and opening remarks uh, given by uh, Dr. Wail Benjeloun. And I would like, before giving him the floor, just to introduce Dr. Wail Benjeloun for those who do not him, know him, especially the, the audience uh, uh, following us. So Dr. Wail Benjeloun, UNIMED Honorary President, is a former president of Mohammed V University in Rabat, Morocco. Today, he is a professor emeritus at, of Mohammed V University in Rabat and president of the Moroccan American Commission for Educational and Cultural Exchange. Dr. Wail Benjaloun has a long lasting commitment to Mediterranean cultural exchanges, university cooperation, and quality education. He served as president of UNIMED from 2015 to 2018. 
He is presently a member of the Governing Council of the European University Center for Cultural Heritage in Ravello. He's also, he also serves on the Board of Trustees for the Alexandria, Alexandria Trust London, and he is dedicated to quality uh, uh, in Arab education and is a member of the Research Commission of the Moroccan National Quality Assurance Agency, ANIAC. Dr. Wail Benjaloun also serves on the boards of trustees for the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies and, the, uh, and of a Middle East College in Masqat. Dr. Wail Benjaloun, the floor is yours. Could you please unmute yourself? Still muted. Yes. Now it's okay. It does. It does help to unmute from time yeah. to time. Uh, Dr. Elkira. But I don't hear you. You don't hear me. All right. I mean, Doctor, what you? Now, can you hear me? Do you hear? Uh, yeah, yes. I can hear. Yeah, I yes, can. we can hear you. Pro Professor El Kirat, probably you should. Um, uh, maybe you should change the channel change. for the interpret. Yeah. Yes, maybe the interpretation. Yeah. Cha um, maybe the interpretation channel is uh, acti activated on your. But I, I, I can hear him. Okay, I'm good. Are we all good? <laughs> I can't hear anything. Oh, no, no. Okay. Um, Professor Kilat, uh, if you can go to the translation and put disactivate it. And uh, uh, if you- I will have to disconnect. No, 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 no. You don't have to disconnect. You have just to change the interpretation. Excuse me, do you hear me when I speak? Because I can't hear the, Yes. Uh, what yes. I do you hear you? I, I tried to write her on the Do you hear him? Yes. So I'm going to leave and then get back. No? I can what hear you. I, do? I don't hear any of you. I can hear you. Yes, I'm writing her on the chat. <laughs> Yes, Professor Adil, uh, could you please uh, suggest help? Because I, yeah. I can't hear uh, what you're say saying and my microphone was working. We, we can hear you, you have only to change the translation. We are writing to you. I'm, I'm writing on the chat, my baby. She maybe she's not reading the chat. I try to phone her. Maybe it's better. No, can't hear anything. Still don't hear anything. I think I will leave and reconnect again. Uh, okay. Can I, uh, so, Professor Ilbenjanoun, sorry for the issue. Can I welcome you all while we wait for uh, Dr. Elkirat to come on? Would that be okay? <laughs> yeah, thank okay. you very much. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, it's a good afternoon. I hope it's afternoon for everybody, but at least here uh, it's, it's afternoon. So, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you all to this special UNIMED week in Brussels, for which Dr. Elkirat has given a very good introduction, so I won't be uh, too long with mine. Uh, this is a, a meeting in Brussels, of course, which is devoted to uh, the topic of importance to both the Anna Lind Foundation and to UNIMED, which is increasingly uh, the interactive effects of climate change and, uh, and migration. Uh, as you are aware, several of UNIMED's subnetworks are devoted to these subjects of international concern. And today's meeting, we shall hear reports from uh, 
the subwork on uh, climate and environmental change as indicated and on the subnetwork on food and water. At the same time, the Anna Lind Foundation is releasing its report and Dr. Kela talked about that. And it's an important report. And I think we look forward to hearing Eleonora Insalco's uh, uh, contribution uh, for the Anna Lind Foundation. And we look forward to Mariam Traore, Shazam Noel of IOM, of course, for the very interesting talk for which she has sent us her slides. Uh, I am sure you will bring, both of you, uh, will bring further into focus the complexities of migration issues. Uh, the meeting is important for three reasons to my mind. The first is that it's the annual exchange between UNIMED and the European Union, the European Commission and the Parliament. And it's, a, it's an occasion for us to convey to the uh, European Commission and the Parliament our concerns as universities around the Mediterranean. It's also a good chance for us to follow the trends in uh, uh, EU policies that are taking place and to be a bit proactive in terms of responding to these policy changes. The meeting is also important because of the long-standing relationship between the Anna Lind Foundation and, uh, uh, and UNIMED. And of course, this is a partnership that was uh, formalized in March, 2019 with the signature of an intercultural uh, support for intercultural initiatives involving academic students, uh, journalists, activists, experts from different backgrounds. So we are working together and it is a valued relationship with Anna Lindt. Finally, and perhaps the most important is the topic is critical to the survival of mankind on our planet. I mean, it's, I'm not, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that, as human behavior continues to impact the environment in disastrous ways. UNIMED has always been in the forefront of uh, science response to socioeconomic trends in our region through its programs and of course its sub-networks. Uh, I'd like to say we're not rediscovering the wheel. I mean, throughout history, as a matter of fact, since the appearance of what we can call man on earth, the Neanderthal, the Neanderthal moved out of Africa. Uh, if Neanderthal had not migrated, we might all be uh, at this time in, uh, in Africa. So migrations and climate and food availability have always been linked and they have driven and they have driven the movement of people. Today, it's a question of scale. Uh, the man-made climate crisis uh, has effects that will probably modify considerably the distribution of populations worldwide. And the numbers are staggering, as most of you know. According to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, 17.2 million people moved in 2018 and may be considered as eco migrants. The World Bank estimates that more than 140 million people will be moving before 2050 in South America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and in uh, South Asia. And in the Sub-Saharan Africa alone, it's going to be 86 million. This if we continue to ignore the situation. So it's clear that we have to move. And this is another, uh, another uh, uh, element of support for this kind of meetings and for this kind of concern. Uh, the just released second World Bank groundswell report estimates that in Morocco, where I'm sitting today, and which is not one of the projected crisis zones uh, 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 around the world, 0 0.3 to 2.7 million climate migrants are expected to be displaced by 2050. And this is a small, a small number relative to others, with, of course, the rural zones, which account for 40% of the population being the most affected. During today's deliberations, we will be introduced to elements of the Anna Lindt report, as well as the conclusions of the UNIMED subnetworks presented by Adil, Joseph, and Felipe, as both organizations again join hands in facing the challenges of the Mediterranean area, sharing experiences and innovating to mitigate climate change and the resulting social disruptions. Discussions will certainly focus in depth on the interactions between the root causes and the measures necessary to alleviate the pressures on the environment. I am sure we all look forward to this afternoon's presentations. Thank you. Have we recovered uh, Professor El Kirat? 
Professor Kilat, I'm sorry, you are uh, you are muted. Sorry, okay. okay. Thank you sorry, much. I just opted for the wrong option for my headphones, so I couldn't hear you. But I'm happy you heard me when I uh, spoke. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Thank could you. you could, could you please opt for Ms. Uh, Insalco? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Benjaloun, for this very uh, interesting uh, information you have given about uh, the webinar. Now, without further delay, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Eleonora Insalako, Head of Operation and Intercultural Research at Anna Lindt Foundation. And of course, uh, from the program, her uh, uh, talk will be about the impact of climatic changes on migration and intercultural cooperation. Again, I would like to give a bio. I'm not doing justice to the people I'm introducing, but this is just to give an idea to the people following about the speakers. She is Head of Operations and Intercultural Research at the Anna Lind Foundation. She's also the editor of three consecutive editions of the Anna Lind Report on Intercultural Trends in the Euromed region, the 2010-2014 and the 2017 editions. And of the Anna Lindt Handbook on Intercultural Citizenship Education in the Euromed region. She's a graduate of the College of Europe with academic expertise in Islamic studies and Euromed relations in the fields of education, research, youth, civil society, cultural studies, and media. Please feel free to Add to this short introduction, I'm sure I'm not doing justice to you, but that was just something I did myself try to collect so as to uh, introduce it to the audience. Thank you very much, Eleonora, and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Professor El Khirat. More than justice, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for this introduction. And uh, good afternoon to, to, every, to everybody. And uh, thank you, Dr. Beljaldun, for uh, your words. Uh, and I would like to, to echo also your words on the importance of our partnership uh, between the Annaline Foundation and, and UNIMED. Uh, as you already uh, introduced, we've been working together for um, over three years, and we are really joining uh, joining efforts to, uh, to bring together our uh, civil society network from the Adeline Foundation side and the academic network of, of UNIMED. I mean, we have quite a few uh, challenges in, in the region and we really believe in the importance of bringing together different sectors of, of society. Uh, of course, uh, climate change is... Uh, one of the main priorities uh, in, in the region and it is becoming a more and more central also to, to the mandate and the agenda of, of the Annaline Foundation. And there is uh, more and more a call from our civil society network uh, to, to invest and to identify ways to uh, address jointly north, south, east and west of the Mediterranean uh, this um, this challenge uh, together. Uh, in uh, May, June, we, we mobilized a, a virtual uh, marathon for dialogue. This was a program of 42 days uh, where hundreds of civil society organizations actually engaged in actions for dialogue. And we came up with uh, recommendations and the priority areas of investment and the environment uh, and the related actions um, came top of, of the list. Actually, uh, civil society in our debate they were calling for a change also of, uh, in terminology. So we are usually referring to climate change, but actually we should speak today of a climate emergency. This uh, be in order also, I mean, this change also of terminology would be important uh, to convey the urgency to, to populations of the region and of course the governments. We all know the, the issue, uh, but we, we feel it is somehow distant from us. Uh, also research that we coordinated was um, highlighting this importance of uh, eliminating this dichotomy that there is between the environment and society so that the people, every, every member of society can take um, awareness on the impact that his, her actions have every day actually on, 
on on the big on the disaster basically that we are uh, causing for uh, for the environment um today i will be sharing with you some of the data from the most recent research that we have carried out this research uh, is part of our uh, programs of action at the Annan foundation and we started in 2008 so we have accumulated data um, from, from around the last 12 uh, 12 years and the data um the empirical data comes from a wide uh, public opinion polling that we carry out every three years on a representative sample of population, Euromed population. So every three years with a rotation mechanism, we um, carry out a public opinion polling around 13 countries of, of the region and we collect the opinions of around 13,000 people that could be considered a, rep a representative sample of the Euromed population. So it is quite interesting, uh, this data, because these data tell us uh, what people think in relation to different issues that uh, pertain to intercultural uh, relations. Now I will be sharing my screen, so just to share with you some of these uh, uh, findings. Um, just to, to let you know that the 2020 uh, survey was uh, conducting in the period of, of the pandemic. So we have data that most probably was also uh, influenced by uh, the consequences of, of the pandemic for people. Um, the countries that we surveyed from uh, Europe uh, are Croatia, uh, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Romania, and Sweden, and from the southern and eastern shore of the Mediterranean that uh, are uh, here indicated with the abbreviation of SEM countries. So we have Algeria, Jordan, Lebanon, Mauritania, and the Morocco. And uh, we interviewed uh, population uh, people above 15 years of age, and the survey was carried out uh, by Ipsos Mori, the international polling company, uh, on behalf of the Annelid Foundation. Uh, so, um, Entering to the topic of our meeting today, so the environmental challenges uh, is recognized more and more by all the people of, of the region as a priority, as, as I was saying. And what is interesting here is that uh, over 84% of people in Europe and uh, we have 88% of people in the southern and eastern Mediterranean region consider that the Euromed cooperation, so increase the cooperation, can bring benefits to the environmental sustainability of the region. So here we have a social basis, an understanding that uh, a joint effort has to has to be made. So involving uh, not a national uh, approach, but one, an approach that should be uh, regional to face this climate uh, emergence, emergency. Um, now our indicator of intercultural relations, uh, one of the first questions we ask people is, uh, what is the level of interest they have to know more about the other? Because inter we consider interest the first step to go towards the other, to then interact and then eventually establish uh, relationships. And what emerged in 2020 is that the top priority area uh, around which people would like to receive more information is actually natural, the natural environment and the impact of climate change in the society. So the, here we see that um, 89% of Europeans have this strong interest to know more about the environment in southern and eastern Mediterranean countries, and 76% of southern and eastern Mediterranean people have shared such, such an interest. So this is interesting also in our approach to, to the media, uh, because uh, it is clear that uh, more media attention should be brought to the topic of the environment, because there is an interest, a genuine, genuine interest among the, the public opinion. When looking at what are the most trusted the media sources uh, about cross-cultural reporting, we see that the north and south of the Mediterranean TV is the main source of, of information. When we go, however, uh, on the southern shore of the Mediterranean and we consider together social media and online media as sources of information, these become the main source of information for 68% of the populations. Social media and online media, they don't have the same um, penetration or, or the, the same level of trustworthiness for, for Europeans. But again, this gives us an indication of where contents, what kind of media contents and where 
they should be produced in order to reach out to people and convey messages about uh, diversity management, management, intercultural dialogue, and issues that are of common concern. Uh, again, on the media, uh, we see that uh, the current impact of media on mutual perception is uh, more negative than positive. Uh, in fact, only 8% of Europeans and 17% of uh, Southern and Eastern Mediterraneans relate that they have changed their views into a positive direction after having read or heard uh, anything in the news. Uh, so still uh, we have a limited impact of the media on the mutual perceptions. And, and a majority here, 14% and 26% relate of a more negative impact of, of media. Uh, we are linking, uh, as we said uh, today, our com discussion on the environment and the migration. So, of course, uh, also uh, Mrs. Traore will uh, make much more this, uh, this link in her, uh, in her presentation. But I would like to share with you that uh, also we ask the people what they consider to be the main characteristics of the Mediterranean region and if this concept of Mediterranean is in their minds. And so we see that the migration issues are a main feature for 85% of people in the Mediterranean. So 85% of Europeans associate the Mediterranean with migration issues. And 75% of Southern and Eastern populations also associate the Mediterranean with the Mediterranean issues. So this is a central uh, characteristic, I mean, of, of the region uh, in people's representation of the region itself. Now, looking, this is a, a slide that I usually consider quite interesting, again, also to dismantle some of the media uh, mainstream uh, discourses, because this slide uh, let tell us something more on what is the inclination of people towards migration. So we ask people, if you had the opportunity to start your life again somewhere else, where would you start it? And we see that we have uh, and we have accumulated data over the last 10 years, uh, actually that it is the majority of Europeans that would like to start in a place different from their country of origin. We have that the 36% of Europeans would like to start their life in another European country. So here we see intra-Europe uh, migration trends. Uh, and only 51% of southern and eastern populations would like to migrate, but only 20% of these uh, of southern and eastern Mediterranean people would like to go to Europe. So here we have a percentage that is quite interesting because we are able to say only 20% of southern and eastern population, if they were given the opportunity, they would like to uh, migrate and move towards Europe. So we could. Uh, a bit put in question the discourse of an invasion from the south towards from the south of the world world towards towards Europe. Um, just to, to conclude and, and again to inform also media discourse and the debate that we are having today, uh, we see that from our survey that we among the Euromed populations we, we see a very good degree of uh, openness to diversity. So we have 93% of Europeans and 84% uh, um, of Southern and Eastern Mediterranean people that consider that the minorities within their society, so religious and cultural minorities, should benefit from the same rights and opportunities as majority of population. And even more interesting, in, interestingly, 77% um, of uh, Europeans and 78 of Southern and Eastern Mediterranean consider diversity as a source of prosperity for their society. So here we have the link between cultural diversity, also as a product of migration, and economic development and, and growth. So this is also an important uh, data to consider. Still, we have uh, minorities in population, 28% of Europeans that also fear diversity and consider it a potential threat to social stability and 45% of people in Southern and Eastern Mediterranean region that have this fear towards, uh, towards diversity. Uh, I just wanted uh, to, to share this data with you. We have uh, thousands of pages actually of, of data and the, the possibility also of comparing 
trends over over time so uh, for example the ones on migration we see an increased uh, trend among europeans to to migrate and relatively to 2016 also a slight increase among the southern and eastern mediterranean people to migrate towards uh, towards europe but uh, we believe that this data could be uh, is open to a lot of interpretations uh, uh, and is open to we would hope uh, to influence and provide the food, food for thought uh, to also public opinion and media makers uh, in order to, to present different narratives uh, about the region. So as I said before, like we will uh, today have also the presentation of one of the authors from our uh, report, uh, Mrs. Mariam Traore, that will share with you also an interpretation of the data related to the environment, environmental uh, migration, but this, I would like to encourage you and your universities to think in which way this data could be even more analyzed. It could be the, the starting point for further researches in, into, into the topic. So I don't take more of your time. I thank you all very much. And uh, let's enjoy this debate together. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Eleonora, for uh, this very insightful presentation and very actually interesting results that we would like actually to see our researchers look at and analyze, maybe uh, provide different interpretations to. Now, without, uh, of course, I would like to give the floor now to the other speaker who is going to present actually more results about uh, this research. Uh, uh, Professor or Dr. Mariam Traore Rajal Noel. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly. So, uh, thematic specialist on migration, environment, and climate change, IMO, International Organization for Migration. Her presentation is entitled Climate Change Scenarios and Migrations in the Mediterranean. Uh, Ms. Mariam uh, Traori Jazal Noel is a senior uh, policy officer at the United Nations Migration Agency, IOM. She has extensive expertise in the climate change and migration nexus. Uh, she has been working since 2011 at the United Nations Migration Agency, uh, IOM, in policy research and operational uh, uh, positions. Actually, I came across uh, uh, the abstract of an article of hers where she talks about these things, and it's really very uh, uh, interesting as a, a, a presentation. Yes, uh, uh, Mar uh, Mariam, the floor is yours, if you don't mind. Thank you, okay. Yamina. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, you said my name perfectly well. Uh, I'm just not a doctor. I wish I was, but I admire anyone who can get a PhD. I know it's enormous amount of work. I'm not there yet. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, Eleonora said a few extremely interesting things related to the findings of, um, of the survey of this year. I was personally actually quite surprised by these findings because, um, I mean, first of all, I've been working on this migration and environment dimension for a while, but we never really approached it from an intercultural dialogue perspective. So this was a whole new dimension that I uh, was um, I had not really thought much about. And I must say that when I saw the results, uh, coming up from the surveys, I was actually quite uh, surprised. So first of all, just to confirm what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about, uh, when I talk about environmental migrants, I'm talking about people who are moving directly, but also indirectly because of climate and environmental changes. And these people can move within their own countries or across borders. Um, and they can be forced to leave or they can choose to leave. So this is the definition for me of environmental migration, which has been issued by my organization, the International Organization for Migration. So um, I think in terms of what's happening in the Euromed regions, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, there are movements which are linked to climate and environmental impacts. Obviously, there are um, there is a lot of uh, internal movements. So for instance, uh, we had uh, someone from Morocco earlier. Morocco is one of these countries that experienced different kind of migration movements uh, because of changes in the environment. 
but it's not just on the southern and eastern shore of the Mediterranean that you see movements. You also have them in France, for instance, my country, or in Spain, where there was a lot of wildfires uh, and extreme heat, uh, even in Finland, um, where drought is displacing traditional um, um, indigenous populations. So there is a tendency, at least in my world, to think that migration movement linked to climate change and environmental change happen mostly on the southern and eastern shore of the Mediterranean, and that these movements uh, are basically people moving from uh, the uh, Northern African countries to Europe, but it's not true. Um, we see a lot of movements within Europe. We see most of the movements happening within countries. So you've highlighted, uh, Eleonora, that uh, the majority of the informants who were uh, surveyed uh, had a very strong interest in learning more about natural environment and climate change. And what I found was interesting here is that um, the level of interest was the same nearly across both sides of the Mediterranean, but it was also the same across uh, generations and across educational levels. So essentially, it seems that climate and environmental change are issues of concern that brings all generations together, uh, regardless of their educational level and regardless of where the, these people are living. So I think this, this shows that it is one of these topics that has the potential to bring people together around a common reflection. Since we are talking about here uh, intercultural dialogue, well, it seems that climate change is a topic that is not so controversial and that most people would be happy to be discuss, discussing. So on the, on the views on migration, um, you highlighted the main finding, Eleonora, for me, which is that um, the that unlike um, a lot of public opinion, the majority of people in southern and eastern shown countries do not wish to leave their country to come to Europe. Absolutely not. Uh, the majority actually would rather live uh, where they are living right now, and if they are migrating, they are not choosing uh, Europe as the as the primary. Um, places to migrate to. So this does not surprise me because uh, over the world, we are seeing the same trend. The majority of the people are not willing to migrate um, and they would rather live in their communities and in their own countries. But there is this narrative that a lot of people are, will, are wishing to cross the Mediterranean or to go from the um, Southern America to the US and so on. But in fact, the majority of people would rather stay where they are. And this has implications on uh, climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation measures. Why? Because if you want to, um, if for people to be able to have productive lives at home, they need to live in environment which are conducive to having a good life. And that includes making sure that climate impacts are mitigated whenever possible. Because what we're seeing in many countries is that people are moving with reluctance um, because they feel they don't have a choice. But if there is a decent environment, most likely these people would rather stay where they are. Um, but um, we also see that Europe is still a region of interest for Europeans, but also from people from the southern and eastern shore of the Mediterranean. Um, so a lot relatively high numbers of people would still want to migrate to a European country, which means in my view that there might be some, um, some work related to uh, European policies that can be done. So there's been a, a few studies that have shown that uh, integrating migrants in climate action in their uh, countries of destination is actually good for their own integration and for the inclusion of these migrants. So that's maybe something which is not really discussed at the moment, but how could you integrate uh, migrants in countries, including in European countries? How can you integrate these people in um, national uh, climate change, uh, green action efforts? with a view to uh, improve their uh, integration into host societies and favor inclusion. So this is really underexplored and this might be one of the policy dimensions from a European perspective that could potentially be um, of interest. 
And the, the third finding, which for me was uh, also very uh, interesting, was indeed this belief in regional cooperation, obviously for environmental sustainability, but also for many of the other issues that do influence um, the decision to migrate. So um, for instance, gender equality, education and training, all of these factors can influence the decision to migrate in connection to climate and environmental impacts. Um, but here, I think we see at least a willingness at the population level to engage in uh, dialogue around regional cooperation, which also uh, reflects, I feel, um, what's happening in other parts of the world where there are more and more regional discussions about what can be done to address environmental migration. Because it's not enough to just try to address the numerous issues at the national level, you also need to take a regional cooperation uh, perspective to fully understand what's happening and to try to respond to what is um, seen on the ground. Okay, so, uh, when I was trying to think why is this data important and why should we care about it, uh, to me it was immediately obvious that um, there, there is at the moment, I feel um, a lot more awareness in um, uh, the um, institutions of the European Union and other European countries, there is more awareness that something needs to be done to address environmental migration and not just to stop migrants from coming in because of climate and environmental impacts, but to also think of um, other policies that can provide protection and assistance to people migrating because of climate impacts. So there is this, this shift I feel in um, European thinking, European policy thinking on how should we address these immense issues and seeing data like that, it really shows that we are talking about um, an issue which is of importance to a whole region. Um, then the EU obviously is in the middle of, of uh, I mean, is always developing very strong uh, climate related um, uh, policies, but these policies usually lack a migration lens. So when we talk about the EU Green Deal, for instance, it can have major implications on the migration of people, but these uh, links are not articulated as much as they could be, and maybe a role that um, we can all play is this advocacy role to ensure that this migration dimension is taken into account. And I think I am probably at the end of uh, my time allocated, but just to say that um, there is a lot that is not discussed at the, e at the European level on environmental migration. I feel that this is slowly changing, but knowledge is lacking. So there is scope to, uh, conduct research projects since we are in a university context as well, but it's scope to really uh, get this data that would allow uh, European countries to better understand how to develop policies to address environmental migration. And with this, I, I'll stop. I hope I was not too long. Thank you. We can't I'm, hear you. I'm sorry, yes. Professor Kirat, we can't hear you. We can't you hear you. If... Oh, and I forget. Okay, perfect. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you, Miriam, for a very insightful result. I actually, uh, that can be taken further and uh, are, can be subject to further interpretation or can be a starting point for uh, further and more uh, precise uh, researches in different countries at different levels and so on. So, and now I think that we uh, uh, can move further in our discussion. And now the floor, I think, is uh, uh, it's the turn of uh, Professor Adil Sahli and Joseph villas uh, uh who will be uh, commenting and reflecting on the migration and food and water uh, 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 situation. So uh, very briefly again, I would like, of course, uh, Adil Sahli and Joseph Villas-Suburus are coordinators of the UNIMED sub-network on climate and environmental change. Uh, uh, Dr. Adil is a full professor of geography at Abdul Malik Saudi University in Morocco. He is co-coordinator of the UNIMED sub-network on climate and environmental change. 
He holds a PhD in geology, a postdoc in geography, and three masters in earth sciences, water environment. And he also holds several international distinctions, such as the best French speaker, speaking researcher in 2019, IEF, the senior expert for national and international organizations, and a reviewer for many scientific journals. He is also the coordinator of many international research projects and head of geography and development group. So I, I know that they are uh, 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 presenting in turn, and I would like to pre uh, introduce both speakers and then we can take the turn to. Uh, Dr. Joseph Villas-Suburus is a senior professor of physical geography and member of the Department of Geography and of the Institute of the Environment uh, of the University of Girona. Um, he is a member of the research group Environment and Geographic Information Technologies. Um, and uh, of the consolidated research group Water, Territorial, and Sustainability. He is the director of Campus of Natural and Cultural Heritage and the coordinator of the project Mehmet. He is also the coordinator of UNIMED subnetwork and of climate and environmental change. So, of course, here uh, I would like to, in turn, to give you the floor and you organize it among yourselves. Uh, uh, who will come first and who will come second. So the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kirat. I, I will take care of the, of the presentation. Uh, I, I will try to, to share my, my screen. Uh, I hope you can see the presentation right now. I will uh, put in full, full screen. Maybe it takes some 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 time because it's uh, quite heavy presentation, but but, but sure, eh? don't worry. <laughs> um, um, when, uh, like like you know, uh, during these uh, last months, we had uh, many different um, reports eh? that uh, are linked with the question of climate change and also migrations. With the Professor Adil, we were working especially in the question of the environmental change in the Mediterranean. But uh, of course, uh, one of the dimensions connected with this, this environmental and climate change is the, the, the migrations. So um, our idea is to present uh, some, um, uh, some results of these last reports and some comments from or a point of view about the situation and the future uh, scenarios. Uh, bueno, like like all of us, uh, all of uh, all of us uh, know uh, very well. Now we are in a process of, of climate change eh, with a big difference between the climate without <clears throat> human uh, interferences or, uh, or uh, with human interferences. No? We are in this process of, of warming of the climate at uh, a uh, global scale. And, uh, but uh, we, uh, we have uh, different agreements. No? The last agreement, uh, the most famous is the agreement of, of, of Paris, no? this idea to not, um, uh, not accept uh, the increase of temperature more than uh, one degree and a half to avoid uh, difficult situations from the point of view of the, of the climate. This is the, the theory. No? The theory is that we need to reduce uh, these emissions uh, and uh, we need to reduce these emissions um, close to uh, 35 gigatons before uh, 2030, for no, uh, to be sure not pass this uh, this uh, deadline eh, of one degree and, and half. This is the theory, eh? but uh, when we analyze the, the reality, so uh, what is uh, what is really done or what is really um, uh, uh, the, the planification of the different countries, we see that the story is not at this moment a story of, of success. Right? We, we are in a, in a very difficult situation 
because one thing is a theory and the other is the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, last week, uh, we had uh, these uh, climate target updates present, uh, and we arrive and we, 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 we know. Uh, Excuse the... me, Joseph. Yes. I wonder if there is uh, some issue with the slides because I'm still in, uh, seeing the, the first slide. Oh, exactly. Sorry. I'm exactly. sorry, I have a problem. Uh, thank you so much, Adil. Uh, I will try to change. Because oh. it's still it's still not it's in the prefer I can share the, the the PowerPoint also for you. Yes, uh, please. I don't know what happens because I am I am uh, I can see very well the the slides, and I don't know why it's not working. Maybe. Do you have a Mac? Yes, it's a Mac. Yeah. So a Mac it always creates problems with uh, sharing on Zoom. Yeah. I don't know. I'm so sorry. Now it's good. Eh? No problem. Now it's it's good. okay. We were, yeah. It's here uh, now. Is the same? You can see also the first one still? No, no. no. Now yeah. we can see. No, no. Now, 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 it's, yeah, no, it's, it's, okay. now it's okay. Now it's yeah. okay. Now it's okay. I'm sorry. Don't spam. This is the, the, the second one, no? this, this uh, process of warming uh, uh, in the planets. No? This is the mm -hmm. question of the, like I told you, no? the objective of reduction of emissions in the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, some more or less no? the, the, what happens now. It's not changing the, the diapo. I don't know. Oh, now, now. Oh, yeah. Okay. And now is the, 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 results, uh, the results of these updates. Eh? Uh, how is uh, uh, the, the planification eh, from the different uh, countries? Eh? And we can see eh, there is many countries that they are not still present. The, the plans to be uh, on, the, on the way of the Paris Agreement and uh, the others, uh, when they are analyze the, 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 the plans of these countries, we can see that at this moment, only one country is compatible with the Paris Agreement, is Gambia, uh, is Gambia in, in Africa. And, uh, and others, they are quite close, no? in, a, in a weak way, it's uh, almost uh, su uh, sufficient. Uh, like, for example, Morocco, uh, Morocco, UK, Nigeria, uh, but, there is many uh, important uh, countries from the point of view of the level of emissions that they are highly ins insufficient, eh? like for example, Brazil or like China eh? or critical insufficient like Russia or uh, others, others countries. Eh? So this is the reality, eh? this is the reality. So, uh, like uh, was published this weekend by the New York Times, no? the Unit Nations warns of the catastrophic pathway with the current climate pledge. This is the situation. And if we move to the Mediterranean region, like uh, maybe you know, uh, the Mediterranean region, you can see here the evolution of the uh, mean temperature an anomalies in green is at the global level in blue is in the Mediterranean. So the Mediterranean, uh, in fact, is uh, the Mediterranean warms 20% faster than the rest of the globe. So uh, this is the situation, no? the, 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 the starting point. Eh? And in the Mediterranean, we have uh, two main factors. We, one is the, the warming process. Eh? We can see here is uh, the information from the EPCC from the Mediterranean region, and you can see the evolution of the, of the temperatures in the, in the Mediterranean region, uh, this increase of the temperatures at the end of this, um, uh, of, uh, of this century uh, in, in one of the uh, scenarios, uh, with the worst scenario, uh, that can uh, increase the temperature, uh, temperatures uh, more or less uh, around seven uh, degrees from uh, from from the the present, huh? and and another uh, really interesting report is the report of Medec huh? about uh, Changement climat uh, climatic and environmental dans le bassin mediterranean, 
uh, uh, the conclusions are more or, more or less the, the same. Eh? The level of uh, warming of the Mediterranean area is especially critical. And on the other hand, we have this reduction of precipitations. Eh? We have the perfect combination for uh, a very uh, dangerous situation in the Mediterranean basin. You know? We have high temperatures and low precipitations. This is the, 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 well, the, the scenarios of the future. Right? There are different scenarios, but uh, it's clear that we are going to a scenario of a high level of emissions. Right? Another thing is the plans of the countries and the agreements. But unfortunately, I repeat again, because I think this is one of the key areas, the reality is uh, another. Right? And the increase of, uh, of uh, emissions is not uh, on the way to, to stop, right? just to increase. Uh, this is the, the same eh, in, the, in, the, in the case of precipitations. Eh? The Mediterranean is one of the areas with uh, one increase of the, of the droughts, mm, of the droughts, and, um, and also the uh, uh, atmospheric extreme events. Uh, so this is the combination, no? the combination of increase of temperatures for one, in one side and uh, decrease of precipitations in uh, another side. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, climate change is one factor, eh? but we are talking about the uh, environmental changes. Eh? And so there is uh, the impact of the climate change, but there is also the impact of other drivers, eh? like air, air and water pollution, urbanization, land degradation, overfishing, eh? uh, non-indigenous species, uh, all, all of these factors. This is uh, part of the combination of elements who uh, can uh, for, for understand the future scenarios also of the, of the migrations. Right? Uh, another um, polemic article was one article published in 2015 that, uh, that uh, connect you know, the climate with the political instability in the Mediterranean. Uh, this article uh, linked the droughts from 2005-2010 in uh, Syria with the civil war. Right? Of course, the situation of these uh, and, and the, all the process of, of refugees and, and, migra and migration linked no, with this, uh, this war. No? All, so all this process of of, uh, of uh, climate warming and uh, link it with migrations, it, it is not only a peaceful movement of the people eh, because the level of instability will be uh, higher in the, in the future. Eh? So uh, this is uh, another idea linked with that. No? See, there, there is uh, droughts, don't we loss of uh, life, uh, livelihoods, migrations, and maybe instability and with, with other uh, context uh, factors. Uh, last week uh, was, um, was uh, submit uh, the, a new report from the World Bank, the Wurons well, the second part of this uh, report. Uh, so it's updated, a new version of uh, this report. This report uh, introduced uh, the question of migrations, uh, the migrations uh, in the scenario of 2050, that's maybe uh, 260 million of people will uh, migrate uh, in six regions of, of the world. Uh, and, and we can see clearly that the Africa and especially Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, the main hot, hot spot. Yeah? And also important, the north of Africa, you know, the, the south shore of the, of the Mediterranean. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, there are not uh, independent areas. Eh? They are uh, really linked as well. Eh? They, they are not hot, independent hot spots. No? 
they are really connected, no? And these hot spots of internal climate, climate migration that are connected to water scarcity, lower crop productivity, sea level rise, heat stress, extreme events, land loss, no? is, is all the factors linked to the, to the climate, climate change. Uh, of course, eh, we have the opportunity to reduce this uh, climate migration eh, because the people, if they, if they migrate, uh, like we, we saw in the, in the previous uh, uh, presentations, they don't migrate uh, uh, majority because they want, it's, it's just because they are forced to, to, to migrate eh, because the, the main part of the population want to live where, where, where they were born. We need to cut global greenhouse gases. Eh? This is one of the main uh, um, uh, elements to reduce this uh, climate migration. But uh, we are not doing uh, we are not doing the, the things well in this sense. Like I told you before, the integrate of climate migrations, the plan for each phase, and invest in understanding the, the drivers. Uh, linked to this process of uh, migrations. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, report uh, introduced three scenarios, uh, three scenarios you, you will see later. One is the more inclusive development with high emissions and moderate development. Another is the more climate friendly, low emissions, unequal development. And the, the, the pessimistic uh, reference no? is the high emissions and unequal development. Um, I really think that the more climate friendly scenario is not just a realistic scenario. Right? We, I think we will move from the more inclusive development scenario or the pessimistic reference. Uh, this is the, the modelization of these different scenarios at the uh, global scale, but for, for us, our attention eh, will be uh, mainly in the sub-Saharan uh, Africa and the North Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like I told you, they are not disconnect uh, areas, they are connected uh, areas, also geographically connected. Um, if we are, uh, if we fix our attention in the North Africa, the three uh, scenarios, then we, we can see that they establish three possibilities. One, the more climate friendly. So the, 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 the migration, it will be around uh, four and a half million of people. Uh, the more inclusive 9.9 .9 and the pessimistic reference uh, 13. Uh, like I told you before, I think uh, the more climate friendly is not realistic anymore. Like it's not more realistic told about the Paris agreements. Uh, the Paris agreements is just, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, is just a dream. Uh, so this is the, the, the different scenarios again eh, with uh, a graph uh, show us these different uh, uh, scenarios. They are connected to these uh, uh, scenarios of climate change and scenarios of um, development. Eh? And we can see again these, uh, the, the same numbers from the, the North Africa. Uh, also, this report introduced another um, element um, really appreciate for, the, for, for me, like a geographer. This is uh, the cartography. Uh, and we can see uh, the areas with uh, immigration. Um, uh, you can see in violet. Uh, uh, the, the dark violet is the high certainty and high levels of climate immigration. And in blue, in dark blue, the high certainty and high levels of climate out migration. So mm -hmm. it's a really interesting map to uh, try to uh, adopt policies to uh, be ready for this uh, future of uh, migrations in the south uh, shore of the Mediterranean. 
Uh, for example, eh, one case is the case of Morocco. Eh, we can see this, this, this table. Eh, they introduce also uh, information about the different scenarios. In the, in the most pessimistic scenario, the movement of uh, population inside of Morocco will be close to 2 million of, uh, of persons, uh, of people, sorry. The climate immigration hotspots, like we can see before in the in the maps, is uh, mainly the big uh, uh, urban areas, especially in the uh, close to the Mediterranean, yeah? and uh, also uh, uh, some other uh, areas. Uh, the climate out immigration hotspots. Once there are the central food, uh, food hills, including around Marrakech, west and southwest coast, including around Casablanca and Safi, and the climate migration in out of uh, livelihood, immigration in pastoral and regional lands with a small net gain, and out immigration, uh, rain feed croplands with a small negative net uh, change. So it's a really, really interesting um, report, in my opinion, this report of World Bank. But uh, we need to take in account that um, really right now uh, we are in a very um, dangerous um, situation from the point of view of the climate change because we are not uh, accomplishing the objectives that we fixed in 2015 in the Paris Agreements. That's all from my side. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, can you please stop sharing your yes, slide? Yes, for sure. Yeah, thank you, Filippo, for this presentation. Actually, it's frightening. It's really scary to hear the results and to see what is happening in the Mediterranean region is really frightening. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's the hot spot of uh, actually climate change. Now, I would like to move to... Filippi Thimodo Barata, professor at University of Evora and member of the UNIMED subnetwork on food and water. And of course, he's also participating in the debate and giving his closing, the closing remarks. So Dr. Filippi Thimodo Barata is a full professor at the University of Evora since 2004, where he teaches several disciplines and seminars connected with history, especially medieval uh, uh, history and heritage and muse museology. He's a former member of the steering committee of the Master of Museology, member of the scientific and pedagogic committee of the Erasmus Mundus Master uh, Technique uh, Patrimoine Territoire et de l'Industrie, and a member of the steering committee of uh, uh, the Harry Med Association, He's a member and vice director of the research center at the University of Evora and a visiting professor at Cape Verde University and associated member of the center Centre d'Histoire et des Techniques, Paris Sorbonne, um, and the, a pro bono manager of the foundation Orient Occident Rabat, Rabat Morocco. Of course, he has led projects teams concerning heritage, including the intangible heritage, and especially with focus on Portuguese heritage around the world. Professor Felipe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I must say uh, before two things. The first one is during the pandemic, I reached the limit of age, so I, take, I, I have to retire from the university. So I am nowadays an active retired professor, if I can say so. Great, yeah, sure. Okay. So this is the first one. And the second one is, I uh, thank you very much to have invited me and being, I'm not an expert in climate change, but this is the opportunity to testify. To testify something that I, I assist for the first time I think 23 years ago, more or less 23, 24 years ago. I'm not sure of the, the exact year because I work a lot in Africa. And uh, in Africa, especially I begin in Guinea-Bissau. 
in Guinea Bissau, they have a system, very traditional, ancient system. I, I think I could uh, try to share my, my, my screen because I have a, a small PowerPoint uh, somewhere. <laughs> Give me just, where is it? Where I put it? I don't, I don't find it out. But uh, it was a system to produce rice, okay? The rice, it was produced in fields they opened in the equatorial forest. I assist that, I saw this. They open in the equatorial forest and they cut the trees there, the boabet trees, to make the coal and to open the forest, waiting for the rains in April to, uh, to have the water to produce and to cultivate the rice, okay? The interesting part of the, the not very interesting part of this, with the trees, they burn, they do the coal. That's why they cut the trees, the big ones especially. And the other part is the, 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 the rice they produce. The point is the communities became larger, bigger, and much more people survive, so they need much more field to produce the rice, so they need much more forest to produce the rice. The problem was, is with the small rise of the water, salt water is flooding some areas of rice production. The, the, the result is the, 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 the landscape there became transformed in a desert. What the most of these people do? Well, I receive them in the Fondation Orient Occident, the Foundation Orient Occident, where we try to, where we receive all the migrants. We receive migrants continent from continent, from uh, countryside to the cities, from uh, migration from different uh, parts in Africa, but also from this part of the world. The interesting part is what these people arriving to Morocco in this case, because I work in this foundation, for the time I was testifying I was testifying what's happened in the Gulf of Guinea. So it is perhaps one of the reasons that pushed me to participate. And I must say, I'm a member of the board of the foundation, a pro bono, a pro bono a member of the board, I must say. And the interesting part is these people in, in Rabat or in Safi or in Tangier, where we have our siege, Ousda, they don't have the opportunity to, to do agriculture. It is their skills, in fact. But these people has a very interesting uh, uh, position. They are open to learn. They are motivated to learn. And uh, the, our, uh, I, 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 I'd like very much to say, that if you, if I invited you all to, 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 to check the, the, the website of this foundation. And the interesting part is we are, we have, a, I can say a special line of supporting women. And uh, so I invited you also to see the link of Migrant du Monde, it is 10 women that uh, we, so we decided to organize small enterprises, uh, innovation enterprises, the innovation comes with the design. Now we move also to Italy. So the interesting part is what to do with these people that are migrating, no matter if it is also from the, a country to another, a continent to another, a countryside to the city, what to do. And this is what, what 
we must think about, I think, I, I think. And by the way, let me say that nowadays the, this foundation is uh, is supported by, because we deal with, uh, we are dealing with uh, children, with, we are supporting by UNICEF and by I, the High Commissioner of Refugees. And I think we, it's fair to say, you have a, a nice role. The interesting part it is, when I testify what is happening in some countries in Africa, I, I could just tell uh, one uh, similar story, what is about uh, happening in Chad. And uh, uh, the interesting part is what it is push me to deal with migrants from 20 years from now. It is a hard job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felipe, for this testimony and for taking us to the field and reporting uh, about the real situation in the field, about what you have witnessed. And I think that such experiences are really worth documenting, actually, and having people uh, testify what they have gone through, what they have really experienced uh, uh, in life would be of great value for the issue. Okay, so I think that now we can check whether we have any uh, um, questions from the audience or even questions from the participants if they have any questions to the presenters. Yeah? We still have some time. We have, I think, uh, 13 minutes because we are supposed to finish at five. So uh, normally uh, I saw a question, but I think that Eleonora uh, 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 answered the question. People asking about how to get the report the, uh, of, uh, you have presented, so it's available. And uh, I think that people would be interested even in the presentation Joseph has, the PowerPoint Joseph has shared, that would be really very interesting because I think that uh, such results should be shared and people should be made aware of the risks that our region, our uh, Mediterranean region is really exposed to and uh, so that pe people become more aware of and more protective of the environment because I, I am aware personally and I, there are here some colleagues from Morocco and from South Mediterranean region to attest this, that there is still lack of awareness of the protection of the environment in the South of the Mediterranean. People are still not very much aware of the harm they are doing to the environment. Professor Wael bin Jaloun maybe can help with this. Uh, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, it would make a lot of sense to have uh, the participants maybe send their slides to Federica uh, mm -hmm. and then we can get them from UNIMED through Federica uh, mm -hmm. at, at a later date for all of the participants. Uh, it's, it's really been interesting going through the transition of these presentations. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want to summarize before before the yeah. time, but it's it's yeah. it's really it's really uh, been interesting. We've moved from uh, I'm right here uh, social impact and human attitudes, and uh, how they determine migration attitudes to the other attitudes towards the other. Uh, we've and you've rightly again you've rightly said that this deserves further study, and that it should uh, uh, be further interpreted. Then we move to the science. But the science brought us back mm -hmm. to the social impact with the overfishing, with the uh, reduced crops, uh, with the uh, low precipitation, but high temperatures and the non-respect again of countries of their engagements in the climate accords. And then finally we come to Felipe and again, it's, 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 it, it's the human behavior. And I think this is, uh, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to think about what to do with these migrants. I mean, the odds are they will be coming in numbers or they will be going in numbers, but they will be moving in numbers. And the, for the host countries, it makes a lot of sense for them uh, to try and arrange some kind of uh, reception uh, even within the same, when the movement is within the same country. Uh, I'm thinking of the slow environmental changes. 
slow environmental changes like uh, acidification of oceans, uh, desertification, uh, coastal erosion, and they have an, exor an inexorable impact on the subsistence and the ability to survive in, in, in hostile affected uh, environments. Uh, it's clear that mechanisms of management and governance need to be developed. And I, I think that's important. And they need to be done, it needs to be done urgently and proactively put in place, focusing on the provision of education, education for these migrants, professional training, employability skills in regions uh, that will be receiving them. And if we do this, it will contribute somewhat to uh, mitigating the destabilization of the migrations. Of course, it does not uh, solve the problem, but it solves, again, the human, uh, it can solve the human uh, impact of that problem. And I think one, one, one of our major issues besides the science, because the science we know, I mean, we can dig our hands in the sand and pretend we don't know the science, but the science is out there. Uh, what we need to do now is take care of the human populations that are suffering from uh, this uh, abuse, if I may say so, abuse of, uh, of our environment. Thank you. Yeah, uh, there is a question in the chat uh, for Eleonora, Eleonora saying that over from Mariam actually, <laughs> uh, over the years, what are the main changes you saw in the data related to migration in the survey? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, actually, we see opposite trends between Europeans and Southern and Eastern Mediterraneans because uh, with data collected in 2009, we had uh, that 65% of Europeans, uh, they were happy to, to stay in the, their country of origin. So 35% of Europeans, uh, they wanted to, uh, to migrate, so 35 However, today we see that 60% of Europeans wish to, to migrate if they were given the, the possibility. And we see uh, over the years uh, a different kind of trend in the, on the southern shore of the Mediterranean because uh, uh, we have uh, in, uh, again, 2009, um, only 37% of people that wish to stay in their country of origin. So it is uh, um, 63% that they wish to migrate. And today we have uh, uh, 51, so uh, from 63 to 51% of people that they wish to migrate. But in 2016, um, they were only 40% that wish to, to migrate. So what I want to, to say is that over the time, people on the southern shore of the Mediterranean, they decreased their trend towards migration, while we registered an op opposite phenomena among Europeans. Again, here it is uh, based on the free will of people, and we are not uh, speaking of forced uh, migration. And then when we are linking to the environment or uh, wars or, or situations that force people to migrate, the reality on the ground they might be different. But it is important to discuss also what is people's attitude and, and, uh, and inclination. Um, migration. So, may, may I say something? Yeah, yeah sure. Look, uh, now, now I put my shoes of professor, okay? <laughs> 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 let, let, let me say the following. Migration, and uh, we cannot disconnect it migration from urban growth. It is impossible to disconnect it. And the interesting part is also migration Euro Europe is quite different. I give you an example. I think it's quite interesting just to understand what I'm talking about. Palermo is a city in the south. Theoretically, the door where a lot of migrate, uh, migration comes in. Hanover is up in the north. They are, have more or less the same population, around 600,000 uh, 6, inhabitants. Palermo has... 5% of foreigners, my, um, migra migrate, um, um, people that are not from Palermo, some 5%, but Hanover has 20%. 
And when I say about 20% means 20% of, our, of our, uh, uh, people coming from Ukraine, people coming from Portugal, people from North Africa, from Italy, no matter, 20% of foreigners. Of course, it is much more difficult to deal with the same pro this problem in and over that in Palermo. And this is the interesting part. It is how to deal with the, the diversity, how to deal with this, uh, this uh, situation. It is not the recipe of the, uh, to the North. It is, it is not the same to the South. And this is the really difficult part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is another uh, question in the chat. Uh, which uh, states, can migration due to climate change lead to in an increase in racial tensions? Well, it's migration, I think it. Yeah, anyone who would like to answer? Um, I really don't, I, I, yeah. yeah, perhaps Eleonora can uh, give the- Eleonora, uh, yes, yes, please. This is just a, a comment. It is not uh, based on, on data. And migration, of course, uh, we see that it increases uh, sometimes uh, re, um, tensions between different groups. But uh, what is interesting here is maybe to, to emphasize more the issue of environmental migration because on our uh, media, I mean, mainstream media, migration is usually associated to uh, economic interests. So there is uh, the general understanding that the migrants are coming I, are going to Europe for a better life uh, while actually there are economic problems. I mean, I'm speaking about the general uh, discussion. So I believe that if we were to link in the, in the media uh, much more migration with the climate issues, most probably also the stereotyping that is linked to, to migrants would, would may potentially be uh, decreasing. So this is a uh, just a consideration, a comment from my side. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have the uh, person managing the Zoom thing to informing yes. me that there are people raising yeah. their hands. Please, yes. Frederica, go ahead. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Raniero Kelly. Now we try to. Mm, okay, Raniero, we, yes, we can hear you. Please. So, uh, hello to all my friends who are around the table. And uh, uh, for those who don't know me, I am from uh, Unimed as well. I am a project senior project manager in Unimed. And I am also have been appointed uh, as an ambassador for the climate pact of the European Union a few months ago. So I'm particularly interested in this, in this uh, topic. And we had the webinar a few months ago about uh, uh, migration, the relationship between uh, climate change and migration. Uh, one thing I want to, to inform you is that, for instance, in Italy, there are a number, a number of, of people uh, in the juridical area who are uh, trying to, to get uh, the, um, the approval for the recognition of the juridical status of uh, climate migrants, which is not there yet. So I would like to know if you have experiences in other countries where the same process is, is going on. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we think, we the ambassadors in Italy, we think that uh, there is a, a big need uh, to learn how to communicate the problems about climate change to the civil society. Uh, <clears throat> also because, as you know, uh, there is a lot of uh, fake news, there are a lot of political usage, wrong political usage, if you may say so, of this kind of topics. So I would like to, to know whether some of, of you would like to, to support uh, the uh, sort of implementation of projects in order to improve the way the problem related to the uh, climate pact, to the climate change are communicate uh, to children, to students and to civil society. Thank you. Okay, yeah, any other questions, uh, Federica? Mm -hmm. Yes, no? so yes, there is another question. Uh, so we can try to mm -hmm. add the participants. I don't know. And Doreen? Yes, Doreen, can, can you hear us? Doreen? Can you unmute Doreen, yourself? Uh, 
as the sound is connected. The oh. sound is off. Yes. Yeah, she's unmuted. Doreen, can you unmute yourself? Maybe or we can. can. Oh, maybe. Oh, no, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, please. I think no. you should mute yes. the person. Yeah. Yes, uh, I muted him. Maybe we can answer to Raniero's question. And yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. Who would like to answer the question? Maria? May I say something? Yeah, may I say something about what Raniero has said? Yes, please. The point is, the point is for us from, I mean, for the people that are dealing with the refugees, perhaps it's easier and it's, it is okay if we organize a kind of refugees that we, we call uh, climate change is refugees. The point is, if the refuge, the, the migrant recognizes himself as a, a, a climate change uh, migrant. Hmm. If he, and I think the problem is at the origin and the, 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 the resol to resolve the situation is at the origin and not in the end. Because, for instance, you take the case of what's happening in the, the the rice fields in uh, in the in the Gulf of Guinea. The problem is how to to deal with the situ situation. I must say there is already uh, organizations in the in the field trying to organize and rationalize this this uh, this uh, agricultural um, uh, works. But the point the point is they have not support enough. They have not support enough to explain they are. They are damaging the forest. They are making the forest disappearing. And this is there, from my point of view, that it is very complicated to speak with them. And uh, sometimes you need to know four or five language, local languages. And so it is really complicated to speak. And sometimes you need, need messengers. You need go-betweens be um, among these communities. There you can resolve much more easily the problem that in when they arrive, the migrants arrive uh, to Morocco or to Libya to Egypt, no matter. And this is, I think, it's uh, worthwhile uh, to do some effort there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Filippi. I, there is a question in the chat room, uh, chat box, and I think we will. Uh, I will read the question, and maybe if the participants are willing to carry on, because normally this session is supposed to finish at five. So the uh, um, question states, uh, do you think that in the coming few years, climate change will make climate migration uh, the major push factor for migratory and refugee flows worldwide? So maybe I can try to, yes, please. to answer that. Um, will it be the, the major push factor? Uh, frankly, I don't know, but I think it's it's going to be even more of a, of a push factor than it is now. I think it's very clear in the, I mean, it's, it's always difficult to isolate the climate factors from other factors when you determine why people move. And it's especially difficult when we talk about slow onset environmental degradation so basically uh, sea level rise or desertification and so on. But what we do now is that uh, as we've seen in the presentations, the world is not on track to <laughs> reduce these, uh, these events. So uh, I personally suspect that climate and environmental change will become one of the main drivers, but it might be difficult to, um, to see that because um, I think Eleonora, you mentioned about economic migrants. Uh, we already see that a lot of economic migrants who are crossing borders, um, that economic reason for crossing borders is very often linked to the conditions in their countries of origin, which are themselves linked to climate impacts. So for instance, climate impacts preventing um, populations to uh, have decent livelihoods options and so on. But these people 
um, to external eyes, they appear as economic migrants. So we already, there the climate dimension is hidden. So looking at the future, um, I think there will be definitely more <laughs> of these economic migrants who look like they are only economic migrants, but uh, for whom the reasons to migrate is a mix between economic and, and climate factors. Over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I just want hand yeah? raised. Yes. yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Baraka? Baraka, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. Can you unmute him, Federica, please? I already done, but I will try again. Maybe I think that is the same answer written on the chat. Uh huh. So which one? How can uh, immigration benefit from its positive aspect in the field of environmental development? Anyone who can answer? Um, so maybe just yeah, a, Maria? A, very few, a very few quick words. Um, there is a lot of, uh, of discussions as well around the positive, what are the positive dimensions uh, of migration in general, and especially in connection to environmental migration. So I think that there are different ways where um, one can highlight, and maybe since we were talking here about intercultural trends and dialogue and so on, um, that could be something maybe of interest to uh, to the audience here. But in terms of uh, highlighting the potential positive um, side of migration in a changing climate, uh, you could look at the, um, how to maximize interventions of diasporas, uh, not just the financial investment, but also maybe the technical um, support they can provide to local efforts so that local communities can better adapt to climate uh, impacts. So I think that there are ways to highlight how migration in some contexts can um, also play a positive role, but not to say that we should uh, adopt a, a narrative that is not based on the facts, but as with most things in the world, migration has a good side and it also has a darker side, but there is a good side here that is very often not uh, highlighted, which is not in the, in the narratives that we hear in the media. Uh, but could potentially be uh, um, a bit of a, of a positive thing. Thank you, over. Okay, thank you, Miriam. Okay, I just want to mention, uh, based on uh, today's webinar and the results uh, presented uh, of the report by Anna Lind Foundation and the results of the two other speakers as well, that it's crucial to undertake some empirical studies on the link between climate change the environment and migration and look at real cases, that is case studies and th synthesis from different disciplines actually. What is lacking nowadays is uh, actually this, these th synthesis from different disciplines such as anthropology, climatology, demography, geography, law, political science and sociology. There is a need to investigate the key issues raised by the climate change, migration, including the social and political context where the issue emerged actually. And uh, as uh, uh, Mariam actually has insisted on the thing, any migratory movement is the product of several converging factors and that environmental stress is always mixed with other causes which may include economic constraints or opportunities, social networks, political context and other uh, uh, factors of course. And of course, with this, I think if there are no uh, other questions, I would like to give the floor back to Dr. Benjelun to uh, uh, close this session. Dr. Benjelun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Perat. Uh, I think I'd like to start by thanking you uh, for having managed this session with such skill and such, uh, uh, such elan. Uh, during the entire thank you. meeting. And I'd also like to thank all of the staff at both uh, UNIMED and Anna Lint, who are uh, 
uh, who contribute to the organization of this. And since uh, Federica is here all by herself, I'll ask her to pass on uh, those uh, congratulations to staff. Um, it's it's been an interesting afternoon. I think uh, many different horizons. Uh, yeah. It's it's a major problem. It's a problem. It's probably the major problem that's going to face us uh, in the coming years. And I think it behooves us to do something about it, both at the source and at the point of arrival for these refugees. So uh, let's try and convey this to our interlocutors in Brussels. Let's try and convey, con convey, con convey this to the governments. And I hope people mm -hmm. like Felipe are in contact with the uh, uh, social and government decision makers, trying to make them understand what is happening and what kind of human suffering is taking place uh, in this area. It's true, refugees are refugees. In the final analysis, when they get there, they don't know whether they're climate refugees or climate multiplied refugees. Has the climate multiplied the effects of what led them there? Has it, has it led to it? But it is a major problem. And I like to just recall for everybody that movement, the right to movement is a human right. Okay, we, uh -huh, uh -huh. we tend to forget that when we talk about uh, borders or something that came in at, uh, at a much later date after, after our initial history started. So let's, let's talk about this, but let's talk about this with an open mind and try and rely on the science, both hard science and social yeah. science to try and solve the problems. And thank you very much. I'd like to thank the speakers for a wonderful afternoon. Uh, and uh, let's let's do this again, and maybe next year we'll have better 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 news. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. And, yeah. Thank you. It's it was my pleasure actually to moderate this uh, session with exceptional speakers, and it was an honor for me to moderate a session with my former president of university, Dr. Wael Shahroun. Thank you very much.